Right. And everybody involved got food poisoning yes. at one point, except for Schwarzenegger. <laughs> we, we will get there because it's fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a pattern with Schwarzenegger and food yeah, poisoning. Yeah. And, and the people he works with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Certain POVs, Another Pass podcast with Case and Sam. This week is a fifth episode. So we're talking about a movie that overcame adversity. Let's celebrate the creativity of the filmmakers. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Another Pass podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my host, Sam Alisea. Hi. And there was something we were supposed to do today, and I, I can't remember what it was. Oh, don't look at me. I Time has no meaning, and I can't remember anything. Uh, is there a planner or something uh, around? Did uh, we write it down? If only know. we were better about having outlines. Oh, wait, I did actually make an outline. Sorry, I just ah! recalled that I made an outline, and oh, we're joined by someone. I Sorry, I, just, I totally forgot that we had someone here with us. Today, we are joined by Ryan Luis Rodriguez. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How is you doing? <laughs> it's starting to come back to me. It's starting to come back to me. Oh, that's right. We're talking about Total Recall today. Oh, we yeah. are? Yeah, we are. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, man. I'm sorry. I just, I spaced. For listeners at home who aren't aware of this one, I'm about to be a dad and let, things have been busy and my like just just basic facts are uh, slipping away from me mm-hmm. at, at, all the time. I'm I'm sorry. We need to improve your implant. Yeah. Yes. Maybe yes. we should have someone in, you know, kind of implant a memory of a vacation so you can relax for a little bit. Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> just refresh my memory. Ryan, who are you? I am a person and a podcaster. Case has been on my show, One Track Mind, where I we- was. You were. I know it's hard to remember now, but you were. It's one of my favorite episodes. That is a show where I look at film through the prism of audio commentaries. It's the best commentary podcast out there because as far as I know, it's the only one. And I actually have Total Recall when it comes to this film, Total Recall. It's the only thing that's memorable, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm still trying to remember the details of this movie. Sam, can you tell me a little bit about this movie? Sure. It was directed by Paul Verhoeven, screenplay by Ronald Chosset, Dan O'Brien, and Gary Goldman. And then the story, the original story, is written by Ronald Chosset, Dan O'Brien, and John Pulville. Uh, I'm going to correct you on the pronunciation there. It's the Dan O'Banion. <laughs> O'Banion. See? Yeah. Don't ask me to read names. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall how to read names. <laughs> And of course, this is based on a Philip K. Dick short story. We can remember it for you wholesale. And it was budgeted initially at like 20 million. And then it eventually got to 40 oh, to yeah. 80 million. And its box office was uh, 261.4 million. So this so it's is fine. Yeah, this is a success. It's like this fine. movie is definitely a success by most metrics that you would use for it. Right. Yeah. This basically assures Verhoeven a blank check for the rest of the decade. Robocop got him to this point. And then this assures that Basic Instinct, Showgirls, Starship Troopers, all of that happens because of this. Yeah. What a filmography, by the way. So, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a wild movie. It's so weird. I'm so glad to be talking about this. This is one of like the first like R-rated movies that I saw, admittedly on TV, but still like I was like, oh, my God, there is so much gun violence in this thing. Because it was yeah. like 1991 <laughs> and I was like seven when I saw it on TV. Yeah, I saw it edited for television. I don't think in 1991 because I was uh, five. But at some point during the 90s, I saw it. And with all the violence edited out, it seemed even more perverse for some reason. So I have that stuck in my brain permanently. Yeah, I could see that. Supposedly when they were making RoboCop and it notoriously got a a hard X rating for the amount of violence in it, every edit that they tried to do to make it appeal to the censors more by removing some of the violence actually made each one of the actual kills like more real. Like it became more visceral because you only had a few as opposed to like the comedic like, yeah, we have the Ed 209 just like blowing holes into someone. And I kind of feel like this movie kind of works on the same logic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I actually was not allowed to watch this movie, and I ended up watching it at a friend's house without my parents' knowledge or permission. (laughs) Because it was too violent for our household, so I wasn't allowed to watch it, even though my parents really did love it, and they would talk about it all the time. But I just went next door, like literally the apartment next door, and watched it. 
Nice. Without my parents knowing, yeah. Yeah, so this movie now has a reputation of being something of like a thinking man's action movie. And I find that really interesting to look at because like it was not received that way initially at the time. Like it was perceived as just like another Arnold Schwarzenegger dumb sci-fi action film schlock. And it's really interesting to look at how, one, I don't think that's true about this. And clearly audiences have started to come to my way of thinking about this one. And two, there's a big question about it that I have to ask everyone before we like get further into a conversation about this movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does the story happen? I don't know. It could be a dream. Right. I mean, that's where they leave you at the end, right? Like, he's like, oh, it's so beautiful. It looks like a dream. And he's like, is it a dream? So, like, I mean, is he in a booth? Is this the vacation that he purchased? And he's a hero? I don't know. Maybe. I personally come down on this movie being entirely inside Arnold Schwarzenegger's head from the moment he goes to recall. Interesting. I have vacillated back and forth between what I think the actual answer is. But especially in this most recent viewing, I tend to believe that at least some of it happened. I mean, at least at the end, I think that that's a tongue in cheek way of acknowledging that it could be a dream. But I don't think that it is. I think that this happened. Yeah, I agree with Ryan. I actually really do feel like at the end, I feel like it's real. And I feel like it's just like at this point, it's tongue in cheek on whether you, the audience, can trust it. Because the whole time... Every single time you feel like, okay, now we're on track. Now we have the narrative. Now we know where we're going. Like this main character feels that way. Something else happens to throw him off. Like when he's in the office and he's just like, who are you going to show me now? My mother? Like, oh my God, who else is going to convince me that one thing is true and the other thing isn't true? And so I think it's just kind of a joke from everyone involved, the screenwriters and the director being like, ha ha ha, was it real? I don't know. Yeah, sure it was. Big kiss at the end. You're welcome. (laughs) So I think it's just kind of poking fun at that stuff. But I would like to believe that it's real and that they did win. Yeah, it's fun because Schwarzenegger has said that he believes it's a true story. Or n- not true, obviously not true. Right, right, like, right. Again, this is no, a sci-fi documented. movie. Like, it happened. Yeah. We all know yeah. this. <laughs> but Schwarzenegger comes down on the side of these are events that actually happen in the narrative of the film. Versus Verhoeven has said that he prefers to think of it as being a thing that happens inside his brain. That scene was the selling point for him coming on board. And he decided to make it more explicit in the text of the film. But you can see that thus, like, this is Schwarzenegger's baby at this point. Like he's the one making this movie occur. So like his say also has a lot of weight to that. So I think you can come down on either side, even if I prefer to think that it's entirely in his head. Like I understand that this is head canon, Right. And it's deliberately confusing. Yeah. I think that it's a movie that succeeds precisely because it is confusing. It's not incoherent. It leaves you a lot to chew on throughout the entire runtime. And it's wild because the short story is explicitly real memories occurring. The events are actually happening. It's less vague about the whole situation versus what we actually get here, which I find fascinating that this is in its own weird way, like more Philip K. Dick-esque than the actual Philip K. Dick story. Right. Yeah, I think so. it's a good nod because, I mean, not necessarily with this story, but he was pretty well known for writing unreliable narrators. And so I think like in a way, This whole movie (laughs) is an unreliable narrator. And so you have this moment of like, both of us or all of us are right. Both the director and Schwarzenegger's take on it is fine. And it's really how you see it. But it's fun. Does it change the story for you, Case? If you think it's in his head versus if it really happened? I think it makes some of the simpler kind of takes on spycraft that this movie has. It makes it more palatable to me. Because as a kid, like I read it as like, oh, no, yeah, he he already had the memories in his head that they unlocked by accident. I read it as very like that the movie was being very honest because I was seven or eight when I first saw this movie. And that's how, you know, <laughs> like that's how kids interpret media. The idea that the movie could be lying to me was not a thing that I could even conceive of at the time. Right. And I think that supports a less enthusiastic take on this movie for me and the response that critics had at the time where it's like more of a here's a dumb action movie kind of thing. Because, like, Schwarzenegger is not, like, that great of a spy. He kind of just, like, is lucky and strong and, like, gets through situations through that. And, like, that's all cool. But the idea that it's actually in his head and that it's a fantasy that he is himself living, I think, works. And I think it works so well that it's Schwarzenegger specifically and not some of the other people that they had wanted for the part beforehand. Because on the one hand, 
you buy it. Like he's huge. Like he, he's this fucking giant guy and he's like an action star. So you're like, oh yeah, I can see that he can go through all these action scenes and you can take it for granted because it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like we've seen him do this kind of movie a million times and we, we'd see it, him do it a million times after that. It's just one of the types of things that he's in for, but the actual events of it all, I think work really well from a perspective of like some schlub who wants to believe he could be a super spy secretly. There's nothing that Arnold does that's like the big, strong motions of it all that I couldn't fantasize about myself doing. Like, I'm not saying that I'm anywhere near that shape, but like the idea that I could rip some piece of machinery out of a cab isn't something that I couldn't fantasize about doing. Like, honestly, I would go to try it and I would fail, but I would still, like I said, fantasize that I could do those things. And so like having this actor who is like this big workout guy who is a construction worker He's in shape and he's got a beautiful wife. These are all like kind of a little too perfect, but it's also the movie version of that. So it's sort of like how he sees himself, how he sees his wife, how he sees all these things that he's fantasizing about. And then he goes into this perfectly laid out. It's all the steps that they said that the Martian spy adventure was going to have. And I love all of that. And the shot that particularly makes it for me as him being like in the dream is that when he goes to recall and they like have him lie, like go back in the chair, he like goes all the way into the recall, the head contraption and it's like glowing and there's big music as he goes back to it. And then it cuts and he's like shifted down away from it. And that's when they go into like, here's all the questions about like what are going to go on in it. And I honestly think at that point is actually a UI that he's interacting with in terms of picking out all the settings he wants in it, but he's already in the state of having the, the memories like being implanted in him. And I think it's it's interesting that nobody can seem to come to an agreement as to what the reality is, because it reminds me of Blade Runner, another Philip K. Dick story where everybody involved seems to disagree over whether or not Deckard is a replicant. We have a right. director and a writer who completely negate the other. And I think that it's appropriate that this follows in a lineage. This is the natural kind of follow up to Blade Runner in that sense. Yeah. And I love that for this movie. Like, I love that ambiguity. I think that if it didn't have it, it would be a less interesting movie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's disorienting, but all of this would be disorienting to actually experience. So it thrusts you into Arnold's head and it basically has you just stew there in your own juices for an hour and 50 minutes, which is kind of remarkable. Yeah. And then you deal with like all these like hyper violent action scenes and like cool visuals and incredibly impressive special effects that are mostly practical or blue screen imposed, but it's still like model work and all that. Like there's a lot of visual treats for everyone when they're watching this movie while they're also thinking over like, is this even really happening? So if you're down for big bloody action movie with cool spectacle and also makes you think this movie is exactly that. Yeah, it's the last gasp of a purely practical spectacle. It's the last time that analog effects would really be considered, I don't know what the proper word is, but the the aesthetic is very much, this is not going to happen again. I mean, if you look just forward one year, you have Terminator 2, where all of a sudden visual effects are advancing into the digital realm. But this, aside from like maybe the shot where he's in the x-ray and they show his skeleton, I think that might be augmented digitally. But other than that, everything is practical. Yeah. On that note, the X-ray is actually the one CG shot in this entire movie. Everything else is in some way practical, either model work that's like being matted on or like literally like puppetry and so forth going on. Yeah, Yeah, like Quato. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What an effect. So good. (laughs) Sticks with us for forever. And it's funny, I referenced (laughs) Quato recently on an episode because we were talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 and how they almost had Krang in it. I was like, you can do like a Quato effect, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like the Henson Company could do that. Oh, my God. That would be disgusting. A live action Krang. Oh, my God. I mean, I would love it. But oh, yeah, my but God. Like, and actually like revolting. growing out of David Warner. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been amazing. But they didn't do it. They just had random scientist who disappears in the middle of the night. But we're not talking about Ninja Turtles right now. We're talking oh, we about can't? Oh, we can't? Oh, damn it. That's why I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you recall, we're talking about another movie. <laughs> but the movie ultimately was a success. It did more than triple its budget, which is even the more Hollywood numbers, like whatever inflated amount that they actually put into it because it kept expanding and expanding and how much it was going to cost. And then it opened really strong. And this was a time where movies ran for a really long time. So it 
did fine. It even narrowly beat out Ninja Turtles 1 for best opening weekend, which is really impressive considering that that was such a huge cultural phenomenon as well. Yeah, and the the highest grossing independent film of all time up to a certain point. Yeah. And this was not <laughs> like this was just a big, stupid movie in an era where big, stupid movies were still the norm. But it was, again, big, stupid movie that makes you think. Mm-hmm. It's fun that we've talked about Arnold Schwarzenegger a lot on this podcast and several times for fifth episodes, because I think he had a perception at the time of being because he's big jack guy with a thick accent, like not the sharpest crayon in the toolbox. But he is, in fact, like very cunning in terms of like what projects he always wanted to work on. And I have heard that at this point, the accent is just affect because it makes his persona easier to sell. And you can see that, like, he has a habit of picking really clever projects and then putting himself in there and having them be really good for his career. Like, this is a good bounce back for Schwarzenegger, along with then doing T2 the following year, that really cemented him going into the 90s as still, like, a viable action actor. Yeah, he knew his limitations. He knew exactly where he couldn't go, but he knew what would be conducive to his vibe. Yeah. Especially in the late 80s, early 90s, I don't think anybody, aside from maybe Tom Cruise, was picking more appropriate projects for them to actually execute. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. More on brand. He's definitely one of the people that understood who he was and how he would fit into spaces and how he could make room for himself in some projects more than probably anyone else. Like I said, this ultimately became Schwarzenegger's baby, but he actually came on the project relatively late. It was only in like 87 that I think he became attached to the movie. And this movie had started pre-production in 1974, which is just kind of it's such a huge timeline. It took 16 years for the movie to get made. Yeah. So at that point, one of the producers, Chassette, who also has a writing credit, had optioned the story because... He liked it. He saw it in an anthology magazine and thought it would make for a good script. And he brought on Dan O'Bannon. So these two ultimately would table this project after working on it for a couple of years to go work on the first Alien movie. But when they were working on this, it was a difficult process because the short story was like 23 pages. And in terms of like making it into a script, it really only covered the details that they could fit into the first act. So that means that act two and three are just complete inventions. Which I find, like, just fascinating in terms of how much of this movie (laughs) there is. Like, everything from when he arrives on Mars past is, like, completely created for this movie. That's the thing. Like, you couldn't tell. I don't think anybody that went to go see this movie probably read the short story. But if you looked at it and you saw, oh, based on a Philip K. Dick story, you would assume, based on this movie, oh, all of this is in there. So the fact that it's not actually speaks a lot to Shusset and O'Bannon. And their ability to take something that was not originally theirs, but put enough of their own spin on it so that it feels cohesive. Yeah. And like, obviously, you can go back and really fill in the details. Like they start talking about Quato early on. They start like laying all the stuff for Mars. And that stuff that like was hinted at in the short story, it just didn't actually happen in the short story. So it's like, okay, now let's get him to Mars. Get your ass to Mars. It's such a famous quote from this movie. Yeah. So Quato is not in the story. No, he was a creation for okay. that happens much later. Well, well done, gentlemen, because, oh, my <laughs> God, Quato is the best. Yeah, it gets crazy when you look at all the different people who then get attached to this. After Alien being like a huge success, Shasa then gets a deal with Disney and so tries to make it work with Disney. But also this is late 70s, early 80s Disney. So it wasn't like they just had money to burn on projects, which is so weird to say now in 2023. Right. When they own so much of everything. (laughs) They had money to burn for the black hole, but no money to burn for anything else. Right. Fair enough. (laughs) Just just keep, just keep destroying more money. Just get rid of it. (laughs) So it didn't go anywhere in that scenario. So it ended up actually getting acquired by Dino De Laurentiis. Right. And then is that when Cronenberg comes on? Yes. So he, that's where Cronenberg came in and Cronenberg is the one who added the mutants. See, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's no surprise there. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's the guy to add him. Yeah, that's just like the most logical chain of thought that you could possibly think yeah. of. It's like, okay, oh, yeah, okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> now, despite Cronenberg not wanting this at the time, De Laurentiis had secured Richard Dreyfus for the part of Dennis Quayle, I should note, 
it was quail in the short story and it stayed that way. The reason it was changed to Quaid by the time we get to the actual movie is for two reasons. One of which is that this was 1990. And so George Bush was president and his vice president was Dan Quayle and they just didn't want it to be that close. Uh, yeah. And another, they wanted it to sound like a little bit more actiony because it was Schwarzenegger and Quaid sounds a little bit harder than like Quayle. Yeah. And of course, Doug, which we all know Arnold Schwarzenegger totally looks like a Doug. <laughs> 1000%. But you know what? He can say Doug and he can say Quaid. And so like that is probably also. Do, do you think his implanted memories were actually like the Doug cartoons? Yes. Oh, my God. That'd be amazing. One thousand percent. I, I want to go to Total Recall right now so I can watch more Doug. Oh, yeah. But only the Nickelodeon era. Yeah. Forget that brand spanking new Doug. That's not my jam. Right. But that actually tracks out because then like so Sharon Stone is like a, a live action version of Patty Mayonnaise. Oh, my God. So who's Skeeter? <laughs> The uh, the cab driver. The cab driver. <laughs> I guess the buddy at the gravel pit would be Roger. Oh, yeah. He's got that vibe. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what we're saying is that Arnold Schwarzenegger clearly is Doug. He's yeah. Doug funny. Just yeah. minus yeah. pork chop. There's no pork chop there, unfortunately. But unfortunately, but that's just, you know, the way dogs go on that whole process. Wow. That's heavier than anything discussed in this movie case. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Dreyfus was attached to play Doug Quayle, and that was not Cronenberg's choice. Cronenberg wanted William Hurt, which is an interesting one to think about at, for the part. And Hurt is a bigger guy, but not obviously he's not Schwarzenegger in terms of like beefiness. Right. But either way, you're seeing more of this like everyman kind of role, because like the short story, it's supposed to be just like. Some schlub is like, oh, no, I'm actually special secretly when the memories get unlocked. I can see how it feed into like, oh, but it's actually real because it's like, well, why does he look like Arnold Schwarzenegger? But for me, I'm like, it's they cast Arnold Schwarzenegger so that we take for granted that it's not actually real. And with William Hurt, it would tie into altered states, which is appropriate. Like, yeah. clearly he knows how to do this thing. He just ended up not getting the job ultimately. Yeah. And they were also looking at Christopher Reeve and Jeff Bridges, which... I find fascinating. Yeah. Jeff Bridges, I could see. Yeah, 80s Jeff Christopher Bridges. Christopher Reeve, I think, is too gentle. God, can you imagine Christopher Reeve in the Verhoeven movie? Like, the violence that we're getting in the movie is just so much more explicit because it's a Verhoeven movie. I can't imagine the Cronenberg one. There would be body horror. There would be, like, a grotesqueness to it all. But I think that those moments where, like, Doug is like, I just killed people would be much more emphasized as opposed to, like, the just, like, there's just exploding squibs everywhere that we get in the movie. Yeah. Um, and can you imagine Chris <laughs> Reeve just, like, blowing people up and being just, like, splattered with blood all over? I don't know. In the midst of doing Superman 4. I don't know. That'd be hard. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think he's too gentle to even be considered. In a million years, I never would have suggested Christopher Reeve for this role. He has a nobility to him that I don't think fits the character. I think it's a gambit for sure. I don't know that it would necessarily fail right away. I mean, because it could play, like if you're playing against type, sometimes it does work in their favor, especially if we're going with cases and the director's kind of theory where it's just like, this isn't real and it's just like an imagined kind of thing. It might work, but it would be really hard. It would be really hard for audiences after seeing him as Superman for so long. It'd be difficult. Yeah. And, and Christopher Reeve was not the draw that Arnold Schwarzenegger was. Yeah. Agreed. Right. I mean, like, if you look at the Superman movies, people are going to see Superman. They're not going to see Christopher Reeve as Superman. It just so happens to be a perfectly calibrated connection but just like you know like tarantino recently was complaining about marvel movies saying that nobody goes to see them for the actors so that's the death of the movie star i mean he's wrong though because i don't like dr strange at all i went to see benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> but that's besides <laughs> the point <laughs> but i can see what you're saying like in terms of christopher reeve like it's not anything else that he was bringing to the table in terms of other movies and he doesn't have the same draw as Arnold Schwarzenegger at all at this point, right? He's already been Conan. Yeah. He's already been a bunch of stuff. He's he's going to go. Predator, Commando, like all these iconic things. I mean, and he hasn't gone on to do his best movie, Jingle All the Way, but I'm joking. Please <laughs> do not quote me on that. But <laughs> Put those cookies down. <laughs> and of course, the most brilliant thing he ever did, which was Planet Hollywood. Indeed. <laughs> 
the most fun you'll ever have eating an overpriced $18 hamburger while sitting underneath the block of ice from Demolition Man. <laughs> if you look closely, you can see Sloane's butt cheeks. Oh, that's going to make these uh, overpriced fries even more delicious. Yeah. Delicious. Well, so anyway, Cronenberg leaves the project. He had a falling out with De Laurentiis. Part of this is that he didn't want Dreyfus, but these things happen, and they were trying to figure out how they could make this movie because at the time the movie was being budgeted more around the $20 million range, and this was going to be, no matter what they were going to do, it was going to be set on Mars, and it was going to be real fucking weird. So it was difficult to actually see how that was going to happen. And wasn't he at loggerheads with Shisset as well? Weren't they having some difficulties together? Yeah, because they had different ideas about the tone for the script. There you go. So the director choice moved on to Bruce Beresford, who I... So I looked through his filmography. The only movie I've seen was Double Jeopardy. Wasn't he Driving Miss Daisy? Was that him? Double checking. Oh, he was. Okay, yes. So never mind. Two. (laughs) Because, you know, these two movies, they really pair well together. They'd be a great double feature of Total Recall and Driving Miss Daisy. Miss Daisy. (laughs) Yes. So they were going to move the filming to Australia, which makes sense setting it on Mars, that is logical. And at this point, Patrick Swayze was attached for the lead, which is interesting to me because I think that, like, obviously he's a smaller guy than Schwarzenegger, but I feel like he plays a similar action type when he does an action role. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So that one's particularly interesting. But then De Laurentiis' company goes bankrupt in 1988, and this is where it all kind of falls apart. And this actually is where the, the production gets really interesting, because after at this point now, 14 years of production, all of the plans get scrapped. The set construction was underway because of the bankruptcy. They were required to destroy everything that they had been working on. And the production had already accrued eight million in pre-production costs and six million in turnaround. And Basically, it's dead at this point, if not for Arnold Schwarzenegger, because he had always wanted to do this fucking movie, apparently. It had been a movie that he was really interested in and that De Laurentiis was just like, no, the whole idea is we've got like some everyman character. So it should be a star, but not like an action star in the lead role. And like you're the definition of an action star. So you're not good for the part. But so Schwarzenegger wanting to do this movie and now it being in turnaround is able to convince Carl Co. Pictures to finance this movie. And because it's Schwarzenegger who's going to be the lead, they're like, yeah, we can get the money for this. Like, it's an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. People will come see this thing. You just go to Cannes, you just pre-sell a bunch of foreign territories, boom. All you got to do is say Arnold Schwarzenegger, Paul Verhoeven, science fiction movie. Yeah, get your ass to Mars. Bingo, bango, done. Exactly. (laughs) Get your ass to Mars. All the investors said, yes, we will get our asses to Mars. Mm -hmm. We'll get all of our asses to Mars and then put it in theaters. And so, like I I joked, this basically becomes Schwarzenegger's baby. Apparently, at the time, he was quoted as jokingly saying that he's the executive producer, but without any of the responsibilities. So basically, he got to call the shots and just didn't have to do any of the work of that, although he clearly was involved in a lot of it, because then he's the one who then picks out Verhoeven to be the director because he was really impressed with Robocop. And Schwarzenegger had apparently auditioned for the lead. One of the things with RoboCop is they had to get someone who was pretty skinny so that they could put all the, the RoboCopness, the fake robot body around an actor. So that's right. so Schwarzenegger was not a good pick for that, but he was in, still interested in the role and really liked the movie. Meanwhile, Verhoeven accepted the offer after he actually read the Mars scene where Dr. Edgemar attempts to convince Quaid that he's still on Earth. And this is where the split occurs, because up until this point, all productions had assumed that the story is really happening. And Verhoeven did not w- take that stance. And so Verhoeven's entire perspective on this movie is that it is all a dream. But again, Schwarzenegger, executive producer in all but name, sees it as all actually happening. So we get this interesting contrast in terms of the production on where that's coming from. But that idea that it's all a dream is a later idea that it actually could be. Again, like they put it in there as a plot twist, as a threat for him to kind of conceive of. But it was always assumed that the memories were real, that everything is actually happening. And this is just them trying to confuse the hero. Except now we have a director who really like digs the idea of maybe the hero is confused. And the Dr. Edgemar scene has him offering Doug a red pill in order to wake up from this nightmare and experience real life. And this is eight years before The Matrix. Nine years, rather, because Matrix is 99. And I don't know if the Wachowski sisters saw Total Recall. I assume they did. They're action junkies. 
Yeah. But I don't know how much of that was influence or how much of it is just a coincidence, but it really, it's something that I really recognized in this most recent rewatch. I've heard that it was an influence on them. I don't know if explicitly the pill itself was. I've heard that the blue pill is related to hormones for when you're transitioning. I don't want to go too deep on all that, but like, it wouldn't surprise me is, is what I'm getting at. So Verhoeven comes on. He really likes this idea that it is all in Quaid's head. So he convinces them to bring on Gary Goldman to do additional rewrites on the script, as well as a lot of his RoboCop crew. So once Verhoeven's in place, the actual production side of it becomes much smoother because it's basically moving over everyone who worked on RoboCop. Not literally everyone, but like a lot of people. So it was very easy to sort of like slot them into this next production and at this point, with Goldman starts his rewrites, there had been 30 drafts had been completed, credited to a combination of Shusette, uh, O'Bannon, John Pavel, and Stephen Pressfield. A lot of rewrites. The Writers Guild rules are very specific on who gets credited on it in terms of how much you actually put in and how much actually gets retained into the final script. So a lot of people had touched yeah, it. It depends on when you enter the production as yeah. well. Like the original writers always get credit. Yeah. I mean, you could rewrite 80% of the script and those original writers would still get credit. Right. right. And here, especially because they were the ones who created all the Mars stuff. So like the broad strokes all go back to those early drafts from the mid 70s. Right. Now, Goldman was not familiar with the short story, but because Verhoeven had read every single one of those drafts and it highlighted all the things that he thought was really interesting about them, he had a lot to like work with and sort of remix and take into what this ultimate draft was going to be. And because Verhoeven had expressed a desire to make it ambiguous how the story would play out, that was also taken into consideration. Now, I have a question involving the recall process. Would all of this have been avoided if he chose Saturn instead <laughs> of Mars? I think so. OK, so I guess, it you know, it's dependent on what we believe happened. But if it's all true and he did live on Mars before, and he did work on Mars for this corporation. And he is a double, triple, quadruple agent switching sides all here and there. Mars would always be the key, right? And he's obsessed with it in the first part where he's watching the news. The news is all about Mars and he can't stop watching it no matter how much his girlfriend tries to distract him from it, you know? So if he had chosen Saturn, that's just a cruise. It's a pleasure cruise. So honestly, no matter what, he would have had a much less interesting time, right? Even if he chose secret agent on Mars, right? And you believe that it's just a simulation. That's the vacation. I think that if the story truly plays out, like it doesn't matter what he had chosen, just them going to access his memories was what opened up the existing ones in mm. him. And they say in that scene that you can kind of take as like, is he half hearing them while he's drugged? Where does the dream actually start if it is a dream? But if it is actually true, like if he is actually Hauser and memories are being unlocked and he's slowly getting out and slowly going through total recall of his past life, then it doesn't matter because they say that they never actually implant the specific memories. And so it wouldn't matter if it was Saturn or Mars. But if it is not true, I think it wouldn't happen if it was Saturn, because I think the thing that's really fucking with him is the fact that they are implanting like the alternate persona aspect, like the spy story, which wouldn't have been part of the Saturn story. There's no narrative. If you're doing the Saturn cruise, you're just doing a cruise. Wonderful cruise. Right. And then the ego trip is the whole secret agent right. thing. Right. But would they offer the ego trip if he chose Saturn? I mean, I guess it's possible that they could have also offered an ego trip, but because there was also an option to just go to Mars and not have an ego trip. So I think the ego trip is the most important part here. But specifically, the ego trip, I think, is the thing that if he is actually either just living out the two week story and then he wakes up and he's fine or he's actually having the embolism and is getting lobotomized situation. Either of those are because of the ego trip specifically. Because there's two ways this is all a dream. There's one where his brain is actually breaking down as a result of them butchering his brain. And then there's one where it's actually just working according to plan. But he's warned in the dream itself that it's that it's wrong. However it goes, we end with blue skies on Mars. <laughs> but do we? Instead of, you know, waves of Saturn? <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to say. Because at the point when they were working on the script now, like going into 1988 and wanting to make this movie pretty quickly, they didn't really feel like they had time to do like 
massive rewrites. It was all fine tuning at this point. There had been so many drafts. There had been so much that they were working on. And Beresford had a shooting script. So there was a lot of work that they could port over from that previous production that had been shut down and everything, all the sets destroyed. And all they really felt that they could really do was fine tune it because they had to start building sets Mm -hmm. like they just didn't have the time. So originally these sets, you said, were built in Australia. Right. And then when this production became the Schwarzenegger production, everything gets moved over to uh, Mexico City. I will note that also at this point in the production is when they create the plot that occurs in the third act of the Venusville running out of air. That was created late Mm -hmm. in production to give additional stakes to the third act, because at that point it was like, this is where it gets sort of fun between the friction of the two viewpoints on it. Verhoeven didn't fucking care what happened in the third act. He did not think that it mattered what events occurred, because in his head it was all Quaid is spiraling out of control. His brain is melting down. It doesn't really matter. We just want to have fun with the fact that this person has gone completely crazy in these memories and is living this like super spy life. But Schwarzenegger and the studio wanted to have an actual emotional connection. Like they had to win for a reason, not just win because they succeed, but like actually save people in the process. And so that was when it was conceived of adding this like, okay, they are now running out of air in this space. And so that victory means that they actually save everyone. Which is great because it actually adds a layer to create a thinking man's yeah. piece more so, right? Because this it ta- then this is more about using a natural resource to control an entire population in a very cruel way. And it gives the movie even more long lasting validity, more than just a bunch of people getting shot and a lot of kick ass scenes and some amazing special effects. And it allows him to do something that is actually heroic as opposed to what happens in the first two thirds of the movie where he just kills a lot of people. Yes. (laughs) So many people. I mean, he's trying to survive and there's something at least like, understandable about it but that's but he is not an altruist in any way in that in the first two acts right it does add a lot there and i remember like being really affected as a kid when like you see like the little girl mutant looking at the fan as it shuts off Mm -hmm. i also remember thinking like man those fans don't have any kind of grates in front of them like that's that's wild (laughs) (laughs) that's dangerous that's a violation and when those things are operating and you slip and you run into one of them oh boy You're Uh going to be red on the red planet. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Then we get into like the interesting themes of the movie. There is this like capitalism unchecked kind of element that is like very interesting. Also, I was paying attention on this rewatch more to the whole like northern block for southern block kind of backstory for like the the planetary conflict that's going on on Earth. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's in like a kind of a new Cold War, but it's no longer with Russia because it's 1990 at this point. And so it's now like. The South? I don't know exactly what. Maybe it's maybe it's the Confederacy has risen again, <laughs> or maybe it's yeah, may, uh, which actually not not out of the realm of yeah. I was about to say it's right. Out of that's, that's, too that's, that's kind of what the uh, is for about. Uh, oh and the gosh. North is just capitalism unbound, which is also not out of the realm of possibilities. Mm-hmm. The idea that someone could be such a powerful financial figure in a colony that he could just turn off a section and kill everyone there and it's fine is terrifying. And for Hoven, lefty as all hell does like pointing out that like, hey, capitalism is kind of fucked. And I do very much appreciate that. And I appreciate sneaking that into an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, considering that Schwarzenegger, you know, Republican politician, ultimately makes it digestible for audiences in a weird way. Yeah, it cleanses the palate a little bit. It kind of removes the thorns from the concept a little bit and it allows you to have an easier way in. Yeah, certainly the 80s and 90s corporate greed kind of story plots primed me for being able to reject the, sort of the idea that greed is good. <laughs> so it is impressive that that's there because like, man, uh, who's to say if I didn't have total recall in my life, would I would I have remained a, a staunch Republican like my parents tried to indoctrinate me into being one? <laughs> I mean, don't worry, you had an alien and aliens, <laughs> so <laughs> they helped too. But yeah, that's all I have to really say about the pre-production before we actually get into it going underway. Like the, it was 16 years. It was so many drafts. It ultimately was 40 script drafts, seven directors, four co-writers, like a crazy whole line of time to actually get this movie underway. So with that, why don't we take a quick break to shout out one of the shows on our network? And when we come back, let's talk about the headaches that actually happened once the cameras were actually rolling. Oh, fun. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? 
Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't screen beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential screen beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? what? That's... No, that's not... Can I call them screen beans now? Fine. Screen beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole screen beans now. Are you tired of watching your beloved characters being tortured by careless authors? Are you sick of feeling like they could have swapped out all of the painful action and the plot would remain untouched? Subscribe to Books That Burn, the fortnightly book review podcast focusing on fictional depictions of trauma. We assume that the characters' reactions are reasonable and focus on how badly or well they were served by their authors. Join us for our minor character spotlights, main character discussions, and favorite non-traumatic things in the dark books we love. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. All right. So once the cameras are actually rolling after 16 years in development, this movie is a lot smoother than what it could have been. Like, despite shooting in Mexico and having some issues because they're shooting in Mexico, it's not quite the predator level of like everything is going terribly. For one thing, they're shooting in Mexico City. It's an urban environment. They're using a lot of like the subway systems for some of the locations. And then there's just a shitload of of sound stages that they have just like rented out. Like it's a huge amount of sound stages that they have for it. And they start with a budget of 30 million. It does not stay there. <laughs> it goes much bigger and things that were hindrances on set. A lot of food poisoning. No surprise. Tons of people got food poisoned, except for Schwarzenegger, because he got so badly food poisoned during Predator. He made sure to have his food yeah. flown down. <laughs> it's kind of similar to what Woody Allen would do whenever he did international shoots he would just bring cans of tuna fish from new york and subside entirely on them that's the last time i will ever say anything remotely nice about woody allen <laughs> and that's that's about right so <laughs> yep that's fair so yeah like everyone was just fucking sick on this production which made things worse for people who were in emotionally uncomfortable scenes such as the actress lycia naff who played the three-breasted prostitute we definitely need to point out this one. She has repeatedly said that she felt very exposed and violated during the shoot of this, even though these were prosthetic mm. breasts, which I find interesting because it's like, OK, yeah, it's, it's fake boobs and whatnot. But she's like very ex- like the, the movie has a lot of complaints about misogyny. And I think it works better if you think it's all in Quaid's head. And so it makes it more forgivable. Another thing, another reason why I like the in, in his head scenario. But yeah, man, like she's got two major scenes and one scene is like, the skeezy cab driver just like rubbing her boobs. And apparently that was not a thing that she was like in a great headspace to deal with, considering that she was dealing with food poisoning while filming that scene. Yikes. Oh, yeah. my God. Meanwhile, lots of injuries on set. Schwarzenegger cut his wrist while smashing a train window. His injuries late. He would cover up with his jacket. Minor cuts and broken fingers as well. Ironside cracked his sternum and separated two ribs Oof. after running into Michael Champion, who was holding an Uzi during the Pursuit of Quaid. So, like, the recoil on it, like, fucked up his sternum. And so they actually had to pause it because Ironside is in a lot of this movie. And so he yeah. wasn't allowed to come back on until he could show that he could do enough push-ups, which his doctor was like, please don't fucking do this. And then he does 30 push-ups, and that hurt him worse. Oh. And so they had to go to Oakland Raiders quarterback Jim Plunkett to borrow a brace that had been built for his own injury that was similar which is just all kinds of fucked up. And apparently he had a lot of trouble breathing while this brace was yeah. on. Like, apparently injuries just abounded on this on this set. And Ironside, his sister was ill with cancer at the time. So he's getting it from both ends. Like, this oh, is God. emotionally and physically getting wrecked. But Schwarzenegger would lend his trailer to Ironside so that he could call his sister and check up on her occasionally. Yeah, apparently Schwarzenegger if he likes you is like a very good friend to have on set. 
Yeah. And if he doesn't, oh, God help you. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. He's also a notorious prankster and, yeah. and will rob you out of money by convincing the costume people to lure you into a bet that you accidentally make, such as the case with Jesse Ventura. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I, this is a wild one to me. The movie was shot in order. That's kind of insane. Yeah. Especially considering all of the injuries they had, like to not be able to, like, try to shoot around. Uh, yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah, and that makes it worse because by the time they're filming the stuff with Ironside, because he's not really in Act One, all of a sudden, like, you have to deal with the fact that he's in basically every scene after that. Mm -hmm. So a lot to work around. Like, that's just crazy. And I imagine it's because they kind of came in last minute to do this whole movie because, like, you would think you would have, like, figured out, OK, we've got the set and we're going to shoot all the scenes for this one set and then move on. Although that said, also the movie, you kind of are constantly moving throughout the whole time. Yeah, it is. It's very kinetic in that way. Like, it's very much a movie on the move. But aside from the injuries on set, oh, I, I should note that because they were filming, especially with like the Mars sets, there was like lots of dust. And so there was inhalation issues. So in addition to food poisoning, a lot of people were having like lung problems, like a whole set of like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. They were like, just use it. You're on Mars. You can't breathe. <laughs> That's something yeah. Verhoeven like, would do. I mean, he is notoriously dictatorial on set. And I'm pretty sure he would he would tell people this, stop being such pusses and just incorporate it into the use it. Well, that makes sense, because he also tried to insist on all the fights being done with the actual actors and not with stunt people, including when the two women have their big fight. And because they couldn't like put padding or anything on their outfits because they're like in relatively tight clothes and are both slighter framed people. It was really difficult and someone had to step in and actually be like, no, we have to use stunt people. Like, we're going to fuck up our people and then not be able to continue shooting. Yeah. People are going to get injured. So then when we get to the final cut of the film, it was 113 minutes and it got a hard X on its initial rating. Shocking. Yeah. So like Robocop, they had to cut it down. In this case, they were able to cut it down to get to an R and then it's just running at an at, uh, hour 51, I think. So two minutes, two whole yeah. minutes. Yeah, that's a lot of footage, especially when it's mostly like exploding blood from people. And even with everything they probably cut out, it still feels like an X. When you're watching it, it feels like you're watching the director's cut of Robocop, where it's kind of like, oh, this is this is how it was the entire time. But really, if you're taking out two minutes, that is not inconsiderable. Yeah, I mean, like I yeah. remember. Uh, so I did a rewatch last night and I was shocked at how violent the like the first fight with um. Oh, yeah. With Roger. Um, yeah. With Roger. <laughs> Since we named him Roger. <laughs> Doug Funny's best friend. <laughs> yeah, like that whole fight is so graphic. And like they do get the moment of him kind of like looking down at the gun being like, what have I done? Like violence has entered my life. This is so it's so weird that I was so naturally able to just blow people up. But yeah, man, like that scene is like shockingly violent. The scene on the escalator when he's riding up and using a dude as his like sh human shield. All these moments are just like just splatter porn. Yeah, I love it in action movies when squibs render human flesh into hamburger. It's one of my favorite thing in R-rated action movies. And Verhoeven is the king of the squibs. Yeah. And then in addition to all the squib work, there were 100 visual effects over 100 visual effects, pardon me, that utilized miniatures and blue screen. And I, like I mentioned, the only CGI was the X-ray screens, which also very prescient there. Like that's now yeah. not too far off from what we actually are dealing with. I was thinking that too. And you got the makeup effects from Rob Bottin, who is the goat, the king of this stuff. I believe also worked on Robocop and did some stuff on Basic Instinct. But this, I think, is his magnum opus in terms of everything that he pulls yeah, off. Yeah, the makeup effects are so cool. Like, when I was rewatching it, just watching him pull out the tracker from his brain and the way, like, his nose is kind of expanding while he's, like, pulling it out. And just, like, that whole scene. I was like, ah, oh, everything looks so good and gross. It's yeah, so when, good. When his eyes are bugging out, when he gets into the atmosphere. Yeah. Like, ah, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Oh, my God. So good. Yeah. Not to mention the skies when he's like pretending to be the woman and uh, checking in at Mars and the, the whole two weeks, two weeks. And like the head starts to like. Right. Uh, we need to cast a woman that Arnold could conceivably fit himself inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a casting call that would have been. Yeah. And it's freaky. You know, when he when he touches his ear and he like basically like goes to pull that thing out, like 
I remember the first time watching as a kid, like that was one of those moments that it was like an oh shit moment. Like I was like, oh shit, oh my God, her head's coming off. <laughs> like she's a robot. And then I was like, oh, it's him. Because, you know, I was a kid. <laughs> Get ready for a surprise. Right. Because it was just like, oh wait, because I remember thinking like as a kid, like, oh wait, is she like, is it just a robot? Like, is it going to blow up? Right. Cause I wasn't sure exactly what was happening. And then the whole head comes off and then his face is distorted. That's another piece of makeup. And then like, it kind of like falls back into himself and you're like, Oh, it's him after all. The guy's right. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great scene. And like the special effects are, were just mind blowing at the time. Yeah. Still are. I mean, still, they, they age relatively well, considering yeah. that the digital is kept to a minimum. Yeah, it, it looks great. And like the blue screen works really well. Like every now and then you get a little bit of the edge line. Yeah, the haloing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like the elevator that he takes up, you know, the one that he kills Richter on and then takes up to like the Martian facility. Like you can see it if you're aware of what you're looking at. But I think it holds up really well. And the fact that we still have like real Arnold moving around in this matting, I think is worthwhile and it, I, I think it looks good music wise the only big note i have on this one is that jerry goldsmith insisted on recording everything in london as opposed to munich which is where they had wanted to do the score recording and as a result that was just a, a little bit more expensive but at this point they were just like tossing additional money at this project like again it started at 30 and it ended up at 80 for their budget which is a very carol co thing to do just throw money at a problem and hope that it resolves itself, which is why they went bankrupt within three or four years. Yeah, like if all of their movies were like this, all it would have been fine because, again, this movie is is a success. It's just you need to make sure that those are hits. Right. It's not a cutthroat island situation, which is we're going to spend one hundred million dollars on this movie and make ten like oof. Yeah. yeah. And so on that note, this movie was a success, but not a super huge hit. Again, critics weren't super in love with this movie across the board. It's very bloody and it's it's very misogynistic. And even if it was 1990, people still picked up on those elements. And it also was perceived as being fairly dumb. And it's really been with time that people have like really come around to looking at, again, as a, like a smart person's action movie. But it, it was a success. It is a thinking yes. man's dumb movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this, actually, that's the perfect description of it, because it's, it gives you just enough to think about and then interrupts you with a bunch of violence, <laughs> interrupts all of those thoughts. And it's just like, oh, that guy died. Like Ronnie Cox has a great line, which is I don't give you enough information to think. Right. Yeah. And he's talking to another character, but he could be saying that about <laughs> the film that he's in. Certainly not enough to settle on an outcome. And like I said, it, it is ultimately a successful movie. It got butts in seats. It was at number one its opening weekend, but it didn't stay at number one after that. Although it then ran for a long time and did fine. It is certainly a commercial success, even if it wasn't. You know, we, we talked about Halloween a few fifth episodes ago. And like, that's, you know, a, a landmark. God, I can't believe you made so much money on such a micro budget movie. Like this isn't that, but it still did fine. And it did fine enough that I would like to spend a moment just talking about the fact that it almost had a sequel. Yes, Minority Report. Right. Fucking crazy. It's insane. Honestly, I love Minority Report as it exists. I can't imagine what a Verhoeven Schwarzenegger Minority Report would look like. Yeah. So the talk was yeah. that it was going to be set on Mars and it was going to be the mutations that would allow people to predict the future enough that they would, mm. would become the foundation for the Minority Report system. And it would have Quaid as like kind of like the super cop on Mars. Which is just crazy to think about. And like... I, I'm glad it didn't happen for two reasons. One, I think that Minority Report would have been a worse movie in that scenario. And two, I think that that would canonize an outcome where the story was accurate. And I, I like the ambiguity that we get. And having a sequel locks you into a particular perspective. But it could be a Blade Runner 2049 thing where they answer it, but they don't answer it. Like they they kind of dance around whether or not Deckard is a replicant still, while also kind of confirming it, but also kind of rejecting it. So what you're saying is that we needed a Denny Villeneuve minority report. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying, Case. <laughs> I report. say that about every movie. I watch uh, I watch Ant Man and the Wasp, and I go, imagine what Denny Villeneuve would do with this project. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, that's fair. Yeah, you know, I I'm like as you said, I'm trying to imagine like what a minority report with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know. I think I am also glad, even though I fall on the side of I think that these things happened and I'm fine with that. These are true events that happen on Mars and people on Mars can now breathe air freely. But yeah, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't, this movie does not need a follow-up movie. It's actually pretty well encapsulated the way that it is. Yeah. I mean, the fade to white at the end is such a perfect moment right there. And like, yeah. like it allows all the different possible interpretations to exist. And like, it honestly doesn't matter. At the end, when he says, well, it's probably all a dream, she's like, well, if it is, just come here and kiss me. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was a dream. It doesn't matter if you believe it's real or that it was all in his head or that it was melting or that he was on some sort of recall vacation with implanted memories. That doesn't matter. You enjoyed your ride. Yeah. Right? Don't think about it too much. It's not about the destination. It's the journey. Right. Right. And you had it. And so it's good. You, you had that journey and you have the memories of that journey. And that's what yeah. ultimately recall is selling. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, I love the pitch in the office when they're selling him the recall vacation. It's one of my favorite scenes. I just think that the guy who does it is so good. And I think that that whole scene, the way that he's selling, because he's basically telling you what's going to happen in the movie. Right. That said, he's not dismissive enough for me about the threat of lobotomy. So I definitely. <laughs> <laughs> he's a salesman. Yeah. I mean, come on. Well, Quaid just like, seems like such a mark in that scene. And I, I fucking love it as a result. <laughs> he's got to get him a used car, man. I mean, that's that's how it works. Listen, not only did this guy was already willing, he walked into his office willing to have it. And then he saw that he could make the up sale. This man is perfect at a, as a salesperson. You leave him alone, Case. <laughs> He's just trying to feed a family. I, I'm just that saying he that. may or may not have. I, one thing I love about this movie is how fucking dumb Arnold seems throughout this entire time. Like, I'm not, and again, I'm not saying Arnold Schwarzenegger is dumb. I'm saying that the character of Quaid comes off as very fucking dumb. Right. And I I'll say it. He's him. dumb. He's very trusting. Naive. You could say he's naive. We don't have to say he's dumb. We can say that he's very naive. We don't have to, but I'll say it again. He's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, he's such a mark for it. Like, his whole, like, wondering about the larger world and the problems of Mars. And, like, his interpretation of, man, like, man, there's a lot of violence going on in Mars. Everything's really fucked up there. We should move there. Like, yeah, that's a really a weird thing, which is why I think everything's real. But go on. Like, I feel I feel like he's the type of person where every like you suggest a thing. He's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. And then you suggest a new thing. He's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. And that's that's him this entire movie. So you're saying he's a four year old. Kind of. Yeah. Well, I disagree with you, though. I think he's more like there is an obsession there. Like, I feel like he's more near diversion. Like, like there is an obsession with Mars. There is like absolutely a drive because she tries like numerous people try to basically convince him and sell him on Saturn. And his friend also like tells him like, Oh, don't, don't go do the recall thing. It's really bad for people. Right. But he is obsessed with this thing. He's obsessed with Mars, even with the talk of violence, even with the talk of like rebels, like shooting the place up. He's like, we should move there. I got to get to Mars. Like, I got I got to go there. Like, and like, no, no, that's a bad place to go. Hey, why don't we go on a cruise? Oh, yeah. Attractive lady that I think I've loved for eight years. Who's been the love of my life. No, nah, I think I'm going to go to Mars. <laughs> you know, like he is obsessed obsessed with Mars. Yeah, it's a single-minded thing. Yeah, yeah, it is so single-minded. Like, I bet, like, if you asked him, he could give you all the stats of Mars, you know? I'm just saying it's funny because it seems like every ad that he actually watches, he then goes and immediately does the thing. Like, he sees the ad for Recall. He goes to Recall. He sees the ad for, like, actually, go to Mars. And he's like, oh, that's how I'll get to Mars. Okay. I understand that the story has plenty of reasons for why. Like, if it, mm -hmm. if it is actually the Hauser pre-programmed, like, impulses for the character or the memories of Hauser, however you want to interpret the, the Hauser plot – pushing that forward and pushing all these things like that all makes sense in the scenario yeah. of this movie being a true story or a story that actually happens to the character. Yeah. But it, I also just kind of adore that. It, it's like, Oh, add for this thing. Guess I'm going to go do that. And I would not be surprised if there's a shot where it's like, Oh, there's a Coca-Cola. I should go get a Coca-Cola. Like, Oh yeah. No, you're totally right. Because he, you would imagine that if you can't even trust your own brain, 
how untrusting you would be of the rest of the world. But that's not him. Like, he goes into this apartment, he gets a phone call, and he's told by a guy to come down and get his suitcase. And he just, he does it. And then he takes that suitcase to an undisclosed location and he opens the suitcase and it's his face talking to him. And he's like, do this, do this and do this. And he's like, "Okay," And he just does it like he just take this towel, wrap it around your head. All right. I mean, yeah, sure. Why not? And put this thing up your nose and it'll drill into your brain to pull out a a tracking device. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, Why not? Yeah, I'll I'll totally do that. That's why I put this here. And then it's like, oh, you got to get to Mars. Okay, well, I'll get to Mars. How am I going to do it? Here's an ad. Sure, that seems like a good way to go. I don't know how else to do it. And I'm going to take this stuff directly to a hotel that's on Mars and hand it to someone. You know, and he's just very trusting of of the entire process. And you could say, well, he has no idea what he's doing, so he has no other choices, right? Like, he doesn't really remember anything so he has no other choice but to do these things but maybe he does yeah and there's really only maybe like a couple of lines written in for him to question anything like he maybe asks the guy a couple of times like who are you how do you know me and that's about it and then he just does everything else yeah it's just like we ultimately have a plot that feels like such a video game to me and i adore it for that Again, I think the movie works better for me by from a perspective of it's all in his head because it's like, oh, it's so simple. Everything he has to do is so easy. Like he like he keeps getting wounded, but it it doesn't actually matter at all. And like every time we have like a mini boss or like a cut scene of like, oh, well, I was like riding there. Oh, there's a commercial for a thing. Oh, that's my solution to the problems I had. Like it all just plays out so like perfectly for him that it just feels like it's scripted. And that's the thing that I really like about this movie. I commented on Twitter last night when I was doing my rewatch that the opening music feels like a fusion of the Conan the Barbarian soundtrack with the Terminator soundtrack. And I feel like what we're trying to do is sell people like, hey, guys, this is an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. And you know what that means, right? It's going to be this, this and this. And the fact that we are playing around with that is this inversion of those tropes. And I think that that's intentional, like, again, having big dumb dude who just sort of lucks into all of this is kind of perfect from a perspective of like Verhoeven trying to subvert action movie tropes. And I'm glad you brought up the Conan theme because that was something that was in my, the forefront of my mind when I was watching the opening credits, I was like, that sounds awfully familiar. Yeah. It sounds like Basil Polidorus' yeah. theme and it enhances it and it adds a little bit of like electronic thing to it. Like the, what sounds like an artificial percussion could be a drum machine, could be something else. I don't know, but it it augments the proceedings and it kind of it's the blend between the digital and the analog that the movie kind of sits at the precipice of. Yeah. And like even if you take a much more like literalist approach to this movie, I think that the movie is still like it's a subversion of the action movie tropes of the 80s as we go into the 90s. And I think that's intentional. It certainly is for for Verhoeven as a director, what he's trying to make here. I think it is a more satirical piece than what people were expecting. And I think that that is why it has had like a larger cultural impact than what it could have had, like the what what people would have expected at the time. Right. Like, I'm just really glad to like relook at this movie. It's it's really fun. I I think the action scenes are great. The squib work is, is fucking just brutal and over the top. But you can't help but like become desensitized to it because there's so much of it. Everything is so memorable. Quato is so memorable. Benny, when he like takes his hand off and we get the mutant hand there, which is like so freaky looking, it's super memorable. Obviously, everyone references the three breasted hooker like all of this. It's it's all over there. Like there's great Schwarzenegger one liners. The music is, is pulsing and, and interesting. I'm really glad just to, to look at it again. It's such a fun fucking movie. Yeah, it's Verhoeven's third best film. But. When you factor in the fact that those other two are RoboCop and Starship Troopers, yeah, that's mm-hmm. an achievement. I think also, like, for anyone who was listening to this who has not watched this, which there might be someone, you should definitely watch it. Because this has held up really well because the effects are practical, because the storyline is fun. I mean, like, okay, it, it is misogynistic. From Case said that. But honestly, it's a fun movie to watch. And I think you should give it a go. It still holds up. And there's some themes where you're like, yeah, that still tracks. 
And then I would say also because this is a classic Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, there is actually a musical adaptation of it. So you should also <laughs> then go check out Lego Lambs, who also did The Predator, the musical. They also did a Total Recall, the musical, and it is quite yeah. fun. Uh, and get your ass to Mars. Yeah. So on that note, before we all get our ass to Mars, because we finally remembered why we were here. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Ryan, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Yeah. Once the movie got going, it was like a little bit more straightforward. But like this was the kind of movie that was just really fun to see, like just how brutal a process getting a script made into a, a final film can be, even if it's coming from an adaptation of a successful author's work who has had plenty of other successful works adapted. Like a 16 year process is not easy to actually make happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Ryan, thank you for bringing this to us. And where can people find you, follow you, check out more of your opinions about movies? Like, I am starting to remember that you have a lot of really great ones. So where is that? So if you want to listen to One Track Mind, that is available wherever you find podcasts. That's, as I mentioned earlier, where we analyze film through the prism of audio commentaries. Case was on the last episode that just dropped with Going Greek. You can find us on social media at One Track Mind Pod on Twitter. And on Instagram at one, that is the numeral one, Track Mind Podcast. I did not get to select that name. That was given to me because somebody already took one Track Mind with the O-N-E, and I'm still pissed at them for it. <laughs> and I also a co-host of Reels of Justice, which Case has also been on. That's a fake movie court where we take a movie and we have a prosecutor, a defender, a judge, and a jury. We try to see if a movie is guilty of being a bad movie. It's so much fun. And you can find that on Instagram and Twitter at Reels of Justice. Both of those are a lot of fun. I was so happy on the most recent Reels of Justice episode that the case that I was on was used as precedent for the justification wow. for the most recent movie. I was so excited nice. because, Sam, you should not be surprised <laughs> about this. It was Alien 3 and I did the Beowulf defense. And it I was, not surprised. And then it, <laughs> then it was cited <laughs> for Bordello of Blood, which was just fantastic. Oh, Wow. Amazing. You are spreading your madness across the <laughs> Internet. Of course, the podcast sphere. But yeah, everyone should be checking out both of those. Those are really fun shows. One Track Mind, as soon as you told me about it when you came on Men of Steel, that the show hadn't launched yet, I was immediately hooked because I love commentary tracks. I love the ins and outs of movie making and finding out those behind the scenes stories. And some are really interesting because of that. And some are interesting because of the things that they don't talk about. So it's just so cool, like looking at this this art form that is has been kind of lost because of people moving to streaming and like those generally not supporting commentary tracks. But that was such an, like a huge part of like my film geekdom of like college age and like my 20s. And so I love that you're bringing attention to it again and making me like actively seek out commentary tracks again in a way that I hadn't been for a while. And they're the original podcasts. Like without commentaries, yeah. there is no podcasting. And I think that it's especially now as we transition to streaming and we're getting rid of all this stuff, I, I find it so depressing. But then you also have places like, you know, the Criterion channel that are uploading their entire extras to to various movies, including the commentaries. And Disney Plus has been recently adding commentaries to all the Marvel movies, which I appreciate. But, you know, too little, mm -hmm. too late. But there are still people out there fighting the good fight, and I hope to be on their side. Yeah. Little known fact, the the first attempt I had at getting a podcast off the ground was with our now editor, Jeff Moonen. We did a show called The Bizarro Bad Touch Time, which was an attempt at doing commentary tracks on movies and just us talking about, like, this is a good movie and these are all the things we like about it and, like, really trying to identify those things. And those can't be found anywhere, so don't look. But if you do and you find them, let me know because I would love to get some of those tra commentary tracks back. <laughs> But it's a thing that I love and I'm so enthusiastic for. So I'm so happy you have that show going. And again, Reels of Justice is just a really fun time taking court proceedings and trying to make that work into arguing if a movie is actually good or not. So people should definitely check out both of those. And then they should head back over to CertainPOV.com where they can find more episodes of this show and other really cool shows. Let's give a shout out to Fun and Games with Matt and Jeff, because, again, this is the first episode with Jeff as our editor. And also, Matt was our previous editor. And, and yeah. we, we, we still love Matt, too. We still love I him. love Matt more than Sam, even, you might say. That's a lie. That is a lie. <laughs> 
bold face lie. But fun, do not appreciate that. But that's okay. I love Jeff more than you love him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but Fun and Games is a wonderful show that that takes a really introspective look into the video game industry. They'll do some reviews every now and then as bonus content, and they do their side quest series where people can just gush about how much they love a video game for five to fifteen minutes. But the main show is a discussion about the culture of video games, looking at the issues facing the industry, and getting really cool interviews with indie developers. So definitely check that out. It's a, it's just a really positive video game podcast, which is rare on the internet. And so I think it's such a breath of fresh air. So please check that out again. It's fun and games. You can find it all the podcast places or at certain POV.com. Sam, if people wanted to find you, where could they find you? Well, they can find me here at another pass, or they can find me on our discord. If I remember that it exists, oh, right. other than that, I am like far too busy trying to remember all the things that I've forgotten about my life and things that are happening. And maybe even if there is time at all, and if there are planets and did I put my water down somewhere? So if you have any complaints about anything I said, I will be too busy thinking about what I have to do tomorrow. So you should bother Case at. Well, you can find me on Twitter for as long as it exists and you can find me there at Case Aiken. You can find me on Instagram at Quetzalcoatl5 because I remember that I had an AIM screen name by that and I'm going to fight to hold on to that memory, <laughs> even though I'm probably going to have my mind wiped at some point. The show is currently yep. on Twitter at Another Pass and you can find all of our stuff wherever you get your podcasts or on the Certain POV website where you can find a link to the aforementioned Discord server where you can just interact with us all. It's a really good time. We have great conversations about all kinds of topics. We just opened up a TTRPG channel. The music channel has gotten really active since we added Jukebox Vertigo to our network. There's tons of movie conversation, video game conversation. So come check it out. It's a really good time. But then once you have checked it out, you should come back here for our next episode. Sam, what do we have next? Well, next time we'll be talking about Highlander 2, The Quickening. But until then, if you enjoyed this, pass it on. Thanks for listening to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast. Don't miss an episode. Just subscribe and review the show on iTunes. Just go to CertainPOV.com. Another Pass is a Certain POV production. Our hosts are Sam Alisea and Case Aiken. The show is edited by Jeff Moonen. Our logo and episode art is by Case Aiken. Our intro theme is by Vin Macri, and our outro theme is by Matt Brogan. I'm really happy with that forget things bit, and I did not know I was going to do it until I started saying Yay. it. <laughs> I feel like that was a really good vehicle for, uh, <laughs> for, for opening the episode. I thought it was good. It was better than Groundhog Day, although that wasn't because <laughs> it was because we had to. CPOV CertainPOV.com